I'm thrilled to be joined today by none other than Dr. Yolanda Colson. Dr. Colson is the Chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Hermes Grillo Professor of Surgery at Harvard Me Medical School. She completed a degree in biomedical engineering prior to attending medical school at Mayo. She earned her doctorate in immunology and did her general surgery training in Pittsburgh, completed her cardiothoracic training at Brigham and Women's, and a fellowship in cellular therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh. She's recognized for an outstanding body of research, having been the recipient of numerous grants from the NIH and the NCI. She's co-inventor on multiple patents, and she's recognized worldwide as a phenomenal surgeon, an innovative researcher, a dedicated educator, and an inspiring leader. In addition to achieving the role of chief at MGH, Dr. Colson is the examination chair for the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. She's the chair of the advisory committee for the AATS Foundation, and she's involved at a leadership level in dozens of other organizations. Dr. Colson was recently elected into the position of vice president of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, meaning that in two years, she'll become the first female president in AATS history. Dr. Colson, for so many women and underrepresented minorities in our field, your election into the role of AATS VP was a huge monumental event, recognizing that this is a progressive and important landmark for our specialty as a whole. And as a female surgeon who's been inspired and motivated by you and all of your achievements throughout my training and early career, I'm deeply honored to have the opportunity to interview you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mara. That's a wonderful introduction. And it makes me uh, feel a little older or a little bigger than I really am, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite honored for the opportunity. Well, and, it, sorry, and I actually think, and I actually think you're, you're right. This is a monumental stepping stone for women uh, and, and underrepresented minorities, because I think it does show that we've actually made it in, in some ways, and that we um, are part of these established organizations and that we are respected as having roles to play in them. And I think it is a very important statement and a very important landmark for all of us. Yeah, so absolutely. Was absolutely. Well, we're so glad, glad to have you here today. So let's get started. Um, as I briefly alluded to earlier, in addition to your surgical practice, you've really achieved remarkable success in bioengineering and developing new materials in thoracic surgery for novel approaches to treatment delivery. So speaking to the younger members of the audience who may be the start of their academic surgical careers, what advice might you offer to them regarding finding a niche or an area in which to focus? And as a follow-up to that question, how would you advise younger surgeons in terms of allocating his or her time um, in terms of developing a clinical practice versus a novel research effort? So I think it's a, it's a great question, and, and it's one that we all kind of ask, and I think the kind of secret sauce, if you will, is to make sure that your research builds off a clinical area that you're really interested in. Sure. I think trying to pick a research area that you think is hot, it won't be hot by the time you get there and are, are writing your grants and have your preliminary data. So do something that you actually care about and have a clinical interest in because it's gonna allow you to kind of build your clinical and your research angles together. And one will feed the other. The more research that you do in understanding the problem, it allows you to become an expert clinically. And the more you clinically do allows you to have patients and tissue and, and ways of studying it. So you can actually work off one feeds the other. And I think that's really important. The, the other thing that I think is really important is for all of us to recognize that progress isn't instant. Mm -hmm. Proge progress is a very gradual thing that you don't think you're making much progress in a field and maybe you get one paper and you get a, a grant, but over your lifetime, what you see is you made real impact in a field, but it's slow. It's like ice melting sometimes, sure. right? Sure. Um, and so I think kind of an example of this is I didn't start out doing the research that I did. I started out completely different, but in the OR saw a problem with local recurrence, drug delivery, and thought this would be a really interesting thing yeah. to look at. And then serendipitously somebody, I meet a student who, want, who needs a project, who wants to work on that, but it didn't start out with an NIH grant. Sure. You started out with a patient who gave us $5,000 that we could buy the materials to do what we wanted to do, right? And so from that grew out 401 grants, but yeah. it started out as a question in the OR, right? And so I think that that's important. That's terrific. And I think that's kind of 
the basis of the traditional idea of a surgeon scientist is that what you do in the operating room can help you in your research and what you do in your, the laboratory can help what you do in the operating room and the reason for the, the premise of a surgeon scientist. You mentioned that what you start researching or um, the area in which you may have a clinical niche at the beginning may not be where you find yourself ultimately. And you mentioned that for you, it was a, something that came up in the operating room. To what extent is it okay to have your, your um, area of interest or your area of specialization defined by the need within your community or the need within your institution? So for example, if you already have a partner who does mini mitrals and you already have a partner who does aortic work, is it important to find something that fits well within your group or how, how should one really think about their subspecialization within their practice setting? I think it's a combination. Right. I think if you have five people doing mini mitrals, that's going to be hard. Right. So it's a little bit of what the opportunity is and how you can build kind of that synergy between your kind of your expertise, what you're interested in clinically and kind of how you want to advance the field. If there's no one in that field, that's clearly wide open. But if you don't have the patients coming in, that's hard, right? So that's one of the reasons my initial research shifted was because what I had started out as my research focus when I moved, I didn't really have the same synergy to be able to build that. And what I saw was an opportunity elsewhere. So it may be looking at what does the group need? Where is the unmet need? Sure. And where's the unmet need in the field? And where's the unmet need with who you're working with? And sometimes it may be partnering with someone who, yes, they have a large practice and you can be part of their legacy and really advance the field. And that works out great. It may be that there's only three cases and there's three people already doing it. So I think part of it's looking at the landscape and figuring out how you can have the most impact. And what about partnering with people across uh, different specialties or collaborating across different domains of research. How, how relevant is that when you're looking at an area of specialization or a research interest? So I think that's actually where the magic is, right? Getting someone who you can be between two disciplines that don't talk to each other puts you in a very unique place. And as surgeons, we have a really important role in that translation, right? So much of my, one of the reasons that I ended up shifting much of my research focus was because I met a PhD who was very interested in helping patients, but actually didn't know the clinical problems of how to do that. Sure. And so one of the advice that I have for any surgeon who wants to do some research is you have to show up to the lab meetings. It seems like, oh, I'm busy and I have these things, but you can kind of cut that out of your schedule and you can protect that yeah. because that's where you actually talk and you see kind of what they have and you go, no, 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 no we shouldn't do it that way because that's not actually a clinically relevant problem. I know you've read about that, but that's not the problem. The problem is this, yeah. and here's, here's the limitation. So whenever you can go cross-specialty, cross-discipline, cross-kind of, you know, scientific kind of groups, you actually can add a lot because you do a bridge that doesn't exist, and all those bridges pay off. That's terrific. I think that's really great advice to all of our audience members who may be looking at really developing both their research and their clinical areas of interest, areas of specialization, and thinking about how they can really contribute to cardiothoracic surgery or really to any surgical field as they look toward their future careers. Um, well, especially, especially if you can, especially if you can collaborate with the medical field, because sure. now they get to know you. We tend to run in our own silos. So now you're going to meet with the cardiologist or you're going to meet with the pulmonologist or the oncologist. And all of a sudden you are speaking their language and they understand your language. It'll actually build your clinical practice. So we've been talking about all these collaborators and support system for our research, for our clinical practice, but we also have some supporters outside of the hospital. Um, I'm aware that you have a wonderful family, including a very supportive husband and two daughters. I'm wondering if you'd be able to discuss with us a little bit how you balanced this uh, family and all of the needs, especially when your children were younger and you were still developing your own clinical research practices. How, how did all of that work for you? So, I mean, we always talk about balance and I think you and I both know balance is a, is a interesting word. Right. Because sometimes it's actually more managed chaos than balance. Yes. And, and, and that works, right? And I think part of it is understanding that that's how it works and that 
it always looks great from outside everyone else doing it. What you don't know is what is what is really going on, what it took today to, to put that together, right? Absolutely. And it's giving yourself a little bit of space to realize it's not going to be perfect. And I think you've heard me talk about before, we have this 80% rule, which is if, if we're close 80% of the time, that's probably okay. So the you know, you have to decide all the kids' outfits aren't going to match and maybe they didn't really eat at the right time of day today, but you got it done and, and it's okay. And you have to recognize that you have to give yourself a little bit of leeway, right? right? I think one of the things that we really did that I thought really paid off, or at least was really important, probably more important to me than the kids, was we had set activities or set times for things. So there was this there was family time. So there was pancakes on Saturday. If I wasn't on call, we had pancakes on Saturday. And it was really a time of sitting down and talking to the kids as what was going on. And it was something that we did together. Yeah. We, would, we would read books every night, even if it was late, even if I fell asleep and the kids would finish the book, but it's fine. We, we still talk about those stories and activities or things that we learned together. So we learned how to horseback ride or we learned how to scuba dive. And it was setting up very specific times where it was clear that it was dedicated time for the family. And I think that was really important. One, because it made me feel like I belonged, which I think is really important because we're so focused on our careers that we feel like we're left out sometimes because there's things that have to get done that you're not there for, right? Yeah. And so I think it made me feel like I belonged and the kids felt like I was involved in, you know, parts of their life that we still talk about this story or kind of, there's kind of a family culture and a family story that evolves and you want to be part of those. For the most part, I find that if you can kind of share a little what you did without making it terrifying or without talking about personal things you shouldn't talk about, about patients, but having them understand why you weren't there today, that you did something that was really important, yeah. I think is very important for children to understand that they're important, but other things are important and that by them being willing to share you, they're doing something important by proxy. And, and they've always felt that. And I think that that is an important lesson for them to learn. Um, the other part of the equation, obviously, is your significant other, the person that's picking up the slack when you don't show. And they have to be flexible and you have to recognize that flexibility. And I actually think it's as simple as saying thank you recognizing that you inconvenience them, recognizing that it's easy to fall into, oh, they went grocery shopping yet again. And we go, well, yeah, I couldn't go, so you went. But it's much better to say, thank you so much for doing that, because I realize I didn't help you on that this week. It's just recognizing that. And I think that's a big part of it, because I think that's how we get through this whole process and still be human and still be sane and still be appreciative. I think you have to have your family and your spouse. Absolutely. Now you mentioned that it is, was actually good for your daughters, some of the lessons they learned by having you gone sometimes and knowing that there are some important other things that you do and how that was actually valuable for them. And that perhaps that aspect of your career was a good part of your parenting in order to show them by demonstration some of the good things that one can do to, to contribute to community. Do you feel that there's also a converse? Do you feel that some of the aspects of your parenting have contributed to the type of surgeon or researcher or um, healthcare provider that you are because you're a mom, because you're a family member? I, I think it helps you if you tune in to your own family. And it doesn't mean everyone has to have kids in a family, but whatever your family is, right? Because there are different types of families. But being able to relate on an emotional level at a personal level, I think really, particularly in cardiothoracic where discussions are really kind of heavy discussions sometimes. Yeah. I think knowing that you can relate and, and from a personal perspective really helps your patients. 
and and I think you don't want to get too cookie cutterish. You need to be able to relate to them, and I think that's good practice, if you will, at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so transitioning and talking about some other people who with whom you've related in your career and in, in your um, development as a surgeon as a leader. You previously said that mentorship was extremely important in developing your career. You mentioned the roles of some of your previous mentors, such as Dr. Sugarbaker and Dr. Del Nido in your own development. So I'm wondering if we can talk just a moment about finding mentors and how would you recommend that surgeons really at all stages of their career find, find mentors for that personal development? I, I think a lot of it is being open to the possibility. I think we kind of go through our days and you're kind of head down and you're, you know, churning away at whatever you have to do and not being open to the fact that there could be something you could learn from someone. Um, I know we've talked before about a lot of times mentors being assigned. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an opportunity to meet someone that may or may not work out to be great. I think it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to meet someone. It's an opportunity to have a conversation. And from there, you assess what that chemistry is like, right? I, I think there are times where you, you kind of have to decide, I'm going to go talk with that person, and I have a particular question, or here's what I really think would be helpful. And I think a lot of times you think, oh, they don't want to meet with us. And yet those have turned out to be some of my absolute best mentors, where I had a very defined thing. I wanted to talk about a particular question here, can you help me with this? I know this was your career path and how did you decide that? Which seems like an interesting kind of conversation, but I didn't just go in and say, I need a mentor, what do you think, right? It was a specific thing I needed help on. So I kind of opened the door, there's a bridge there. And some of those have been where I've gotten answers and it's been useful to me and I've moved on and they've moved on and it isn't there but some of them have been tremendous. And it's that understanding of what's that connection and how do they help you? So the whole reason I ended up in cardiothoracic at all was because Michael Kay um, from Mayo did a bunch of research and I wanted to talk to him about transplant and cardiac surgery, not recognizing that there weren't many women in the field at that time. And I go over there just saying, so, I, how, how did you make this decision and how does this work? And can you tell me about transplant? And I ended up do, working in the lab for a long time and, and going over there and seeing things. And he would call me every year or two, you know, for 20 years. How are you doing? What's up? That just started because I went over and told him I was going to get an MD, PhD. And did he have thoughts on things I should study? Because I was interested in this. Um, I ended up, you know, with Dr. Sugarbaker, I ended up doing cardiothoracic at Brigham because it was his program and yeah. it was a conversation about how about, you know, here, what does this have to offer? Like, where do you think the field's going? That sort of thing. And clearly that, you know, I was at Brigham for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Dr. Del Nido, I met in Pittsburgh because I was on the general surgery service and did a rotation at pediatric cardiac and really liked cardiac surgery. And so it was a little bit of, so what are the things you need to learn? How do you balance research? And then, so you can think of those questions, but it's getting, it's getting, it's thinking about it, being um, organized about it, but sending an email and calling people and see if they'll talk to you. If you're organized and you have discrete questions, the conversation will go from there. And I think that's one of the ways. Sometimes people don't have the time and can't do it, but sometimes they will. And it, it tells you a little bit that that'll potential for a good mentorship if they have time to talk to you. If they don't have time to talk to you or are too busy, it's probably not the best mentorship, right? Right. So as we, we talk about your mentorship experiences among the people who mentored you, um, I know there was a diversity of individuals who shared different strengths with you, some of them potentially research interests, some of them clinical interests, maybe even other aspects of your life and your career and leadership development. And I know that you mentor a wide diversity of trainees and young surgeons um, who have similar interests and who can learn things from you. I also know that you've had extensive leadership um, with women in thoracic surgery, and you will be the first woman president of the AATS. And a question that I have for you is, 
in addition to having a, a wide breadth of mentors, is it important to have someone to whom one can connect, especially if you are an underrepresented minority? Is there a value to um, being mentored by someone who, you know, looks like you do or has similarities to you from a demographic standpoint? It, it fundamentally changes your belief that it's possible. And that's why I really try to mentor so many people. And then the second half of that mentorship, although we talk about them being separate, is sponsorship, right? So it really is about seeing someone, if you can mentor someone that you can see has, has the potential and the trajectory, that sometimes I find I have to tell someone who's like me, a woman underrepresented minority to say, no, no, you can do this. It's okay. There's nobody, you can't see the path, but it's there. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the whole thing is to help people see it, help them organize their thoughts, understand what the pathway is because I'm far enough ahead. I can look backwards and go, actually, there's an opportunity over here. Sure, that sure. I couldn't see going forward, but maybe I can see now in, in retrospect. And as a sponsor, I can open those doors. And that's really the power of having people, having such a diversity in leadership is because people don't recognize that the doors have to be different or the pathway is different or what they're bringing is different. So therefore the opportunities are different. And it's really looking at how can we really do diversity and make our specialty stronger. And part of that is because we don't need the same solution over and over. What we need is 10 different solutions, right? Yeah. Oh, that's really well stated. I, I really appreciate that insight. I think that's, that's incredibly helpful for um, a lot of the young members of our specialty, but also some of the more established members of our specialty to hear your perspective on that topic. Well, uh, and I think, I think it's a, it, it's a real part of maturing because you do have different parts of your career and different aspects that you need to do and it's one of the obligations as you get further in your career is to make sure that you're taking care of the young people trying to come through right that's fantastic you know speaking of people coming through a lot of recent discussions including this one have really emphasized early career surgeons including trainees who are so important to the future of our field I'm wondering what advice you have for mid-career surgeons, those who have developed their practices, may already know their niche, but are perhaps unsure of how and where to grow once that hustle of early practice building is kind of slowing down and research setup is a little bit more calm. Um, so for people at that stage, how do they keep themselves, their career, and their practice developing at the mid-career level? And do you think that that process is important? Oh, it's fundamentally important. Um, I see kind of three phases in careers overall. I see that early phase, which you're absolutely right. It's that kind of hustle. It's about, you know, yourself and your survival. And how do you do that, right? How do you immediately survive? How do you build a practice? That sort of stuff. But then you're absolutely right. Because then there's kind of this pause. And you're like, okay, now what? Right. And I think that's an incredibly um, vulnerable time. I think it's particularly vulnerable for women and underrepresented minorities because that's the time you start looking around to say, okay, now what? But I don't see the pathway. I don't see right. how this works out. I start to think I've been working hard and I can't quite get through that ceiling. So I actually think that mid-career level becomes really important. Okay. And that mid-career level is that where do I fit? What is my national role? And it's where you need to start looking at, okay, I've built this part, but how do I fit in and what is my impact? What's my national impact? It's where you start to work with your sponsors and your mentors about where can I start making my mark? What am I really interested in? I've seen enough now, right? To know where I think is really great. And what do I want to start having impact? What are the what are the committees I should be on? And how can I get on those committees? What are the things that I need? Where do I think the key problem is? And how can I actually start changing that? So it's the part where you start to form yourself. It's kind of like that teenage of who am I gonna be? And yeah. I don't say that in a bad way. It's where you start to form who you are. 
And the senior part, you've kind of had that impact. Now it's, it's us thinking about what does the field need to do to grow and survive? And how can we nurture that mid-level? Because that's the people who are going to have the impact and take us to the next level. And, and we need to reach out and be sponsors and put those people in the positions of leadership because they're gonna be our legacy. And it's recognizing that, that as you get to senior, it's not about you now. It's, it's about that early career getting them so that they're safe and can start and survive. But the mid-levels are the ones that have to have the impact and we need to really coach them into being leaders. And, and, and I think the other message for the mid-level is you need to be flexible because that's actually where my research shifted. And if I had stayed where my research was, because I was working in, you know, climbers and bone marrow transplant, not yeah. that that's not important, but I didn't have the support to impact the field in that. So by shifting, it was a different direction, right. but I could do far more. And so it's getting your mentors to help you figure out where your next five or 10 years needs to be as mid-level so that you can have the impact for later. I think that may, it may be a common um, fallacy that once you get to that mid-career stage, you don't need mentors. And I think that's a time point, like you've yeah. explained, that one really does need mentors to get to the next level. And coaching, especially potentially from mentors or from external coaches as you're becoming a leader, um, recognizing, um, you know, just like the book, what got you here won't get you there, you know, recognize right. exactly. everything you've exactly. so hard to do to get to this point where you are right now may not be anything that you need to get to the next place where you want to be. And, and I think that it is very common for folks once they get, you know, kind of get their footing and they feel safe and they feel steady and they know what they're researching and they know how to take care of patients in their own setting to kind of think, I don't really need help anymore, but it's kind of hard to continue to grow if you don't continue to. And that can be very, and that can be a very scary transition. That transition to something new when yeah. you think it works and like, is what I have better than what I don't know, first off, right? And the, and the second is to realize that the, that the field has changed from when you started, right? So it's like, if you learned everything as a thoracotomy, you gotta move to VATS and you gotta you move to robotic, right? right? So you have to be able to make those transitions. And, and, and I think that's particularly challenging when you don't have role models to see how they got there because you may look at something and say, well, yeah, but I, I can't do that or that's not sure. me and how do I get there? And the point is, is by showing that it looks differently, that transition becomes less scary. But I do think we need to reach out and do a fair amount of sponsorship and sometimes sponsorship is pushing people, right? Yeah. You, you need to do this and you'll be fine and I'll help you that you'll be fine but you need to stretch a little bit because it's not as safe, but it's how you, it's how you move up. And so I think that becomes really important. That's terrific. And one of the things that I heard you mention when someone in their mid career is thinking about what the next step is or um, how they want to make a difference that questions they need to ask themselves are really, how do they want to be remembered? What is the, the achievement that they want to leave behind? So just jumping off of that discussion, I want to ask you, um, in, in your enormous achievements and all of your leadership positions, can you share with the audience how you personally, um, Dr. Yolanda Colson, want to be remembered as a leader and what type of legacy you want to leave behind? Um, I, I think it would be that, that all of us want to be remembered as a, you know, excellent surgeon who took really good care of their patients. I think none of us are in the business that don't want that. Right. But I think in addition to that, it's about being collaborative and about expanding the field and making our field better by being more inclusive, bringing people into it, looking at the different gifts that people bring to our field. And if we can use that to make each of us stronger, make people happy in what they do, That'll lead to better patient care. And I, I think that I just want people to understand their value. 
And it's really about being inclusive. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much for those wise words and for sharing so much of yourself on this interview today. And I certainly want to sh thank all of the CTS Net listeners who've been um, watching this interview. Um, I feel very honored to have had the chance to speak with you and we just really appreciate you and we, we look forward to your continued leadership. I want to thank you. This has been a lovely interview. Thank you, Mara.